Hello, friends. Welcome back to part two of my second interview with David Such. I will have my first interview as well as the first half of this interview linked in the description. David Such is a near-death experience researcher and is back today to discuss some very interesting topics such as what is going on with those hellish near-death experiences. Also, we're going to talk more about Earth's evolution, the process that we're going through now, and the role of this new generation of children that is coming in and how they're going to impact our planet. If you haven't watched the other interviews that I've done with him, I highly recommend them just to get a little more background on who he is and the issues that we've discussed up to this point. All of that will be in the description as well as David Such's links. Thank you for watching. Here's David. I love that. It reminds me of something I heard you say in your interview with Jeff Mara, and I don't want to steal his questions, but I'm just going to read this back because I think it was so good. You said the active ingredient in any religion is love. Oh, sure. Yeah. Captain Cook's brew. <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't, did we talk about it in our last? Uh, I don't think so. Captain but if, Cook's if brew. You, even if we did, it bears repeating, I think. Yeah. Love, love in religion. So I see religion like Captain Cook's brew. So in the late 1700s, when ships made long voyages lasting several years, it was very common for half or even two thirds of the crew to die from scurvy, which is a lack of uh, vitamin C in the diet long term. So they would have, you know, salt pork and rice and beans and anything that's not going to spoil being on a ship, but they didn't get fresh fruits and vegetables. So they got no vitamin C that get scurvy and die. Now they didn't know what caused scurvy. They knew that a return to a normal diet on shore would cure it. Captain Cook had a brew that he served up to his crew that contained an odd mixture of ingredients. It had malt and soap and sauerkraut and all sorts of things. One of the ingredients was lemon syrup, which is loaded with vitamin C. Now, the rest of the ingredients had little or no effect. The active ingredient was vitamin C. So if you drank Captain Cook's brew, you didn't get scurvy. You lived. But it was only because of one active ingredient. And I see religions of the world sort of the same way. The active ingredient is the love of our creator. And you can find it in almost any religion, barring the extreme elements of some religions uh, where they feel it's their sacred duty to kill in the name of God, anybody who doesn't believe in their particular, I mean, that's not, but, but most of the major religions believe in very similar things, you know, brotherly love, charity for the impoverished, peace, forgiveness, self-control, good behavior. God doesn't choose between apples and oranges. He loves all of his children, regardless of our decision to live in light or darkness, regardless of what religion we subscribe to or we're brought up in. Um, we're a family and he adores us no matter which branch of, of the tree of life we branch off into. You know, we can branch off into Catholicism or Judaism or Hinduism or Christianity and, and you're still connected to the trunk. You're still connected to the core of God. So that's kind of how I feel about it. So well said, David. And that brings me to another question. I get this from people quite often where they will ask, is there one specific religion that is experienced in near-death experiences? And specifically, a lot of people will ask me about Islam because I think it's more common to see a near-death experience that promotes like Eastern, like Hinduism or Christianity even, although not fundamentalist Christianity, but Jesus will appear in near-death experiences or people will see Buddha or see um, Eastern themes. Are you familiar with any Muslim near-death experiences? I am familiar with a couple. I recall one man who, uh, wasn't a near-death experience. It was a um, sort of a spiritually transformative experience. I think they call those STEs. And he was in a, in a jail and he was praying every day. He had, was doubting his faith and was praying every day. And after two weeks, you know, God appeared to him or Jesus appeared to him, this light. And it just transformed his entire life. You know, near-death experiences can tell you when you're standing in that love that's beyond description you know you you cannot not be transformed by that it's it's just going to change you forever because it's it's the best thing that ever happens to you in, in your entire life it's it's the all of everything is to experience that love 
and it it transforms people. So yes, Muslims have had near death experiences. They have been confused. You know, everybody thinks that it, the afterlife is going to be just like their religion taught them, and of course, it never is. It's always a little bit different. And <clears throat> a lot of Westerners, you know, we think uh, it's a it's a bad religion, right? Because there's there's violence in it. Well, I, I think most of them are good people. Um, you don't hear it so much on the news, but you know, religions are are maturing, right? So there was a case, I believe it was in 2011, when uh, there was a a group of a hundred uh, or so Muslim women on a bus, and seven of them were Christians, and they got stopped by an extremist group that was looking for the Christians. And these Muslim women passed out the head coverings for their Christian friends. And they, they told this, this terrorist group, they said, well, you know, we're not going to tell you who the Christians are. We're, we're supposed to be a religion of love and peace. And so if you, if you want to kill the Christians, you're going to have to kill all of us. You know, they were protecting them. And then there was uh, some violence a number of years ago in the Middle East against, uh, there was some threats against uh, some Catholic or Christian services um, and Muslims got together and they formed human shields around these churches. And they said, we're, we don't subscribe to what they believe in, but you're not going to kill them because they believe in something different than we do. And the Sufis, of course, which is a section, a segment of, of Islam, believe in respecting and honoring all religion. And they are extremely peaceful and nonviolent. And so we have this concept, we, we believe what we hear on the news, and the reality is, is much different. There can be uh, good, and one can find the compassion of God in, in almost any religion. I just love to hear stories like that. And I think there's so much more of that type of thing going on in the world than we realize, because the news is constantly portraying all the negative things, which a lot of times is being hyped up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a well-crafted fear report. Yeah. And if there's nothing negative to report on, they'll spin it to make it negative, <laughs> you know. Exactly. Cuz they they build on fear. And uh I like to watch the Good News Network. So even that's going to change. So humanity is changing and eventually we're going to demand good news. And the news is going to be filled in the future with stories of love and compassion and goodness and good things that are happening because there's a little secret to consciousness and that is thoughts are things now in the afterlife it, it's pretty instantaneous you think about an apple in your hand and an apple appears in your hand and you can eat it now here it's it's a very long drawn out laborious process but thoughts are still things okay our thoughts and words have power that was one of the first things i heard very early on over and over again from in near-death experience testimonies and i didn't understand it and i know it sounds sort of mystical and new age religion you know we create with our words and thoughts well we do so when we get to a point in our culture where instead of an entire culture focused on the news and negativity we're all focused on positive news do you know what that's going to do that's going to create more of the good stuff that we're focused on i mean it once we get rolling in the right direction and we stop doing foolish things like always focusing on negative, you know, it, it gets real interesting real fast. It's going to start really, you know, the ball's going to start rolling with consciousness. And I don't think it's going to be more than a generation or two before we achieve peace on earth personally. Now that seems when you survey the world today, that seems impossible. You know, it seems like things are getting worse and worse. Well, what's happening is the darkness that was always there, that was always hidden is being exposed. And it's going to extinguish itself through exposure. So as people's consciousness is rising, they're gonna be less and less tolerant of this darkness and this bad behavior, and they're gonna just start making changes. And when the children who are being born today, you know, 30, 40 years from now are in positions of power, they're gonna do things differently. It's already happening in the Middle East. Now, you don't see it on the news so much because the older generation isn't on Facebook as much as the younger one is. But in the Middle East, there's, there's uh, Jews and Muslims, children 
adolescents that are getting together to play games and, and talk to each other and ask each other questions to get to know each other and find out about their commonalities. I mean, if you want to, if you're a Muslim and you want to go on a plane and you want to eat uh, food according to your religion, you know what you ask for? Kosher meal. I mean, they have so much in common. And the Muslims and the, and the Jewish children are, are being, they get taught in school by their parents, this is why we hate that other group and why they're evil. And they're saying things now like, well, well, that was in the past. What, why should I hate them now? Because they're parents and grandparents that have nothing to do with them. They did these bad things, so I'm supposed to hate them. I don't, I don't understand why, we, why we're supposed to hate them if that's, in, you know, that stuff happened in the past. The, <laughs> the kids are going to change this world. They're going to get in power and they're going to make some changes. And it's going to take the older generation to die out before mm -hmm. it happens. And then there's some people in the older generation like me and, and, and you, well, you're not, you're in the younger generation. <laughs> there's some people in the older generation who are waking up and they're going to help kind of lead the way and, and be guides to these younger people who are making these changes. So the new world of love is coming and it's going to start with the kids that are being born today. They're, they're born with a different mentality, a different yeah. consciousness, a different mindset. And they're going to do things differently. They're going to do things better. And I'm really glad you brought up the topic of the children, um, because this is something I'm hearing a lot about. Like I mentioned Dolores Cannon off camera. She says that there's been three waves of volunteers who actually came to help with Earth's evolution. And the third wave is this generation of children that's being born. And they're coming in with this heightened awareness and gifts. And I can attest to this as a mother, I have three young children and I just feel like I'm like, they're my teachers. Like, I think they've taught me more than I could ever teach them. Like for just for one example, sorry. And I know I'm supposed to be letting you talk here, but <laughs> I I, hear I, this. my daughter is 11 years old. She is so far beyond me intellectually. I cannot keep up with her. So she has taught herself how to code, how to do computer programming, and she's gotten into anime with her dad. So she's really into um, Japanese comic books, manga, and she's taught herself graphic design so that she can create her own manga. So she's like years of work she's put into all this. And we're sitting under the, the tree outside yesterday as she's working on her manga on my little app on, on my phone. And she goes, okay she's like on the first page of it and she says now i'm gonna make this manga about things that i think are important like racism and discrimination and she's 11 years old and this is what she cares about and i think it's not just my kids like this is a common theme that we're seeing in this new generation and it's just it blows my mind yeah um when i was a child in school you know 45 50 years ago if somebody had some sort of disability or something, it was pretty common that that person got harassed and made fun of. And now you see these YouTube videos where it's the opposite. The other kids are taking care of them and nurturing them and making sure they know they're special and wanted and, and uh, it's a different consciousness. Yeah. And it's yeah. And I'm really excited to see what they're going to do. Yeah. Now the other thing that's going to happen too, is that we're in a different energy. So the earth is moving through space and we are being exposed to different energies now than before. And so we have the energy of love working with us more than ever before. So before people who were trying to live in light and compassion and love, it was always an uphill battle and we always lost, right? So mm -hmm. no good deed goes unpunished, right? Well, that's, that's changing. And now the kids that are going to be born in the future, they're not going to have to learn everything over again. They're going to remember what they learned from previous lifetimes. And some of the kids already being born are talking about remembering previous lifetimes. And I've heard stories of kids, you know, telling their mother, a little girl says to your mother, well, last time I was your mommy. <laughs> you know, and the kid remembers it. Yeah, right? I've heard those stories too. And so it's changing. And we're going to come in better equipped. We're not going to have to start over again and learn everything over. We're going to remember previous lifetimes. We're going to remember our purpose. We're going to, we're going to have a veil that's 
a little more transparent than it was before. Mm -hmm. So the veil is becoming more transparent for more and more people. And that's just part of the maturation process of, of humanity and consciousness. I have a theory about the hellish near-death experiences that I'd like to run by you. And this is a question I get quite a bit is, what about these hellish experiences like powered storms and others? And my theory is that there's different realms in the afterlife and it, just like you were saying, like on the other side, things are so much more thought reactive like you think something and it instantly appears so my theory is that in the so-called for lack of a better word lower realms like some of the astral realms that people will experience when they're astral projecting or maybe right after they leave their body they could be um, creating maybe individually or even collectively like maybe we collectively created some of these hellish places but then maybe in the higher, truer realities, um, hell doesn't exist at all. What are your thoughts on that? Okay, so, you know, we have, we tend to separate things and put them in a box as human beings. You know, we have steps to things. You know, how many levels of heaven are there? Well, how many levels of love do you have for your children? <laughs> There's no such thing. There's really no such thing as heaven or hell. There are simply realms created by, and you hit the nail on the head, the collective group of souls or consciousnesses that are in those realms. And like groups attract. And so if you have a group of very low consciousness or low vibrational um, souls or beings that are creating a very dark energy place that you would call hellish, I mean, we, re we refer to as the positive realms and experiences as heaven and the negative ones as hell well that's like you know if you went to california and you drove through beverly hills and you said well that's heaven and i'm going to drive through compton and the slums and that's hell well no they're just different neighborhoods and so people who have been to the hellish realms they describe it as being attracted like a magnet so if you're in a certain vibrational state low low vibrational state you can be attracted to those realms uh they're not punishments they're not permanent sentences. I think those realms would not exist if they did not have a purpose in advancing consciousness. And I really think all we the best we have here is analogies. You know, we're not going to understand certain esoteric spiritual concepts from our tiny little monkey brain human perspectives. So the best thing we have is analogies. So an analogy I'm going to use is is if you ever watch these uh, TV shows, there's one called I Shouldn't Be Alive, where somebody is stranded, you know, there's a plane crash in a mountain, and they're stranded for a week, and they're trying to survive, and it's, it's a hellish experience. A lot of these, when they get to the end, and they're finally rescued, now, they're still in their horrible physical state. Some of them, you know, haven't eaten or had water, and some of them are hallucinating. I mean, they're in horrible physical states the moment they're rescued. And they describe this elation, this, this feeling of, you know, the best moment of their life. So how do you experience what good food is if you've only eaten good food every meal all your life? Go without eating for a week or eat really lousy food for a year. You know, and you go back to eating good food. It's a different experience, isn't it? Yeah. You know, you having a problem with appreciating your partner that who, who you love very much, go without seeing them for three months. And when you see them again, oh my God, you know, oh my God, it's so good to see, right? So we grow what we want by experiencing what we don't want. And I think that's the purpose of these lower vibrational realms. I think they're created by the collective groups of souls that are there. It's a voluntary, voluntary thing, and the lower vibrational realms are there to be as scary as possible so that the soul knows, oh, I should choose light. Wow. I'm in the jacuzzi. It's nice and warm. Yeah, I'm going to go check out that pool. I know it's only 35 degrees out here in uh, Minnesota, but I'm going to go see it. And I stick my foot in there. Go, oh, heck no. I'm going back in the jacuzzi where it's warm. 
<laughs> you know, and I appreciate the jacuzzi a lot more now that I know how cold the pool is. Uh -huh. <laughs> so that's kind of how we are as souls, I think. That's my theory. Very insightful. Well, David, thank you so much. This has been an amazing conversation. Would you like to share with people where they can get in touch with you or if you have any projects you're working on that you'd like people to be aware of? Uh, sure. You can get in touch with me. My phone number and email are on my website, godtookmyclothes.com. And there's also a link to my spiritual counseling that I do for people who, are, who have had a near-death experience or going through a spiritual awakening or have had out-of-body experiences or STE, spiritually transformed experience. And, and you think nobody's going to listen to you. People are thinking I'm crazy. Well, I'll be the person who believes you if you're interested in that. And it's a donation basis. If you don't have money, I've got time right now. I'm not overbooked. I'm happy to talk to you whether you can donate or not. And I'm just grateful for everybody out there because you guys keep me going uh, with your good questions and your desire to kind of learn and grow and become more loving, compassionate people. That energizes me and keeps me going. So I'm grateful for all of you. Well, this conversation has definitely filled in some blanks for me and inspired me as well. So thank you so much for doing this. Thank you, Melissa. It was a pleasure being back on your show.